It's so like Inception. It is. It's, it's very <laughs> meta. It's like me watching me. It's, it's <laughs> This is basically. There we go. We're making tech. Whoa, or that. There you go. Ta-da! Pretty. Ah. Alright, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. And if you still watch it. Of course, you're cool with that. Yeah, I knew you're cool with that. I want to know. Oh, okay. Well, why don't you do that first? Do that first? Yeah, why don't you do that first? Because I'm gonna go ahead and do that. All right, so we're going to have yeah. their raffle tickets. We've got so a couple unclaimed prizes. I want to call the ticket numbers off. So go ahead and pull out your tickets and the bottom. All right, so I recently drew for the, um, the laptop tablet bag that had no name or identification on the back, but the ticket number is... Four, five, eight, three, nine, two. Three, nine, two. All right, we'll call again after yeah, the session, session, just before we redraw. And for the Snag It bundle, it's ticket four, five, eight, three, three, three. We'll announce it again after if more people wander in, so. Yeah, I mean, I have, I'm still going to have lights in my face, so. Okay. So, we're going to sit and be, you know. Well, she's got to stand up um, and respond to this. Alright, we're going to get started here. Has everybody had a good day? <laughs>
is copyright infringement. People a lot of times think they can use anything they find online as long as they give an attribution and a link back to the original. What you might be doing in that situation is committing copyright infringement, and because you're giving a link back, you're telling the person about it. <laughs> I have had my work stolen four times. Every time the person links back to me, and so the second someone followed that link, I saw it in my analytics, and I went, oh, who's linking to me? Let's go look at that. And it's so like, oh, look, you stole my shit. Thank you. <laughs> oh, by the way, I swear professionally, if that offends you, you got the rule with your feet. Um, so, yeah. And so once that happens, I have to deter, I have to determine how am I going to respond. Um, twice, I DMCA'd the person. The other two times, my work was stolen by lawyers. Um, and I know. I was like, really? You should know better. Uh, but I decided to play nice in the legal sandbox, and I called them. And... We had a discussion. Um, so yes, as Danny mentioned, creativecommons.org is your friend if you are looking for photos. Um, that's where I get the photos for most of my blogs. Uh, I always pull photos that I can modify and commercialize. The license to modify lets me crop it. The license to commercialize lets me make money off of it. And I don't sell anything directly online um, through my blog. Um, However, one of my blogs is attached to my law firm, so that is a commercial venture. And then, you never know, someday I may start selling something through my personal blog. Um, and when that happens, I don't want to have to go back and look at all my photos and figure out which ones I, I can't, or that I you know, can't commercialize, and because then I have to switch them all out, and that's just a lot of work I don't want to do. Um, so, you know, you may call it lazy, you may call it efficient, but that's how I roll. So that's, yeah, creativecommons.org is your friend. Um, otherwise, if there's something you want to use, ask permission. I've never had anybody say no when I've asked to use a photo. Um, if you want to quote somebody, it's when you're getting into fair use and it gets complicated. So I'll jump off that bridge if someone asks me about it. The other issue I want to talk about is trademark. Um, this is something that bloggers and podcasters don't think about, especially if you are a hobbyist. Um, or you're just doing, you know, a small little, you know, my blog pays for itself, maybe make a little bit of money, but not really, it's not your full-time job. So your trademark is the name, the logo, the slogan that you put on your stuff when you sell it. So, you know, you think about Nike, that's the word Nike, it's the swoosh, it's just do it, it's probably various names of, the, of their shoes are trademarked. Um, so the name of your blog is a trademark. Um, name your podcast, if you have a slogan, a logo, those are all potential trademarks. If you don't register your trademark with the United States Patent and Trademark Office, that's okay, but you only get what's called common law rights to it, which is based on your geographic market, which basically is based on your readership. So if you have a small readership, you know, it's like your mom, um, which is what my blog was when I started, you know, my, my geographic scope was very, very small. Um, so... That's all you get. And so if somebody outside your scope, outside your geographic scope, wants to use the same name on their blog, they can. And you can't stop them because they're in a different geographic market. If you register your trademark with the USPTO, you get the exclusive right to use your trademark on your product coast to coast in the US, regardless of your actual demographic, your geographic market. Um, and you can stop other people from using the same name on their pro on their blog or their podcast. Um, and so you still may be thinking about, why would I register my stuff? I'm just a hobbyist. If you don't register, somebody else might. And then when that happens, you could keep using your trademark if you had it first, but you can never expand your market. Which if you're online, just by natural re readership increasing over time, you're not allowed to expand your readership, which basically means you have to shut your blog down. Otherwise, you're committing trademark infringement against the guy who registered, before, you know, before you. And I actually saw this really happen. Um, go Google Turner Barr, uh, Barr with two R's. He was a guy who started a blog uh, called Around the World in 80 Jobs. Cool idea. His premise was, I'm just going to buy a plane ticket and travel around the world and work from place to place and blog and make videos about it. And, you know, so he's not making tons of money, but he's making enough to, you know, get by, um, didn't register his name. Why would he? He's just a guy in a website. 
Unfortunately, after he started doing his thing, um, another company came up with an idea for a, a contest that included a blog called Around the World in 80 Jobs. I wonder where they got their inspiration. Um, and they registered that trademark. So when that happened, Turner could have kept using his blog, but he could never expand his market. So one, how do you determine a market for a blog um, without having to hire experts? You can't. So probably just hiring the expert would have been hellaciously expensive. And then to fight over it legally is a ton of money. And really, I recommend staying out of situations where you have to get lawyers involved because we cost a lot of money. Um, we do, and it's a pain in the ass. Um, especially when you're in the technology realm where there's people who don't even understand how to turn their computers on and you have to explain what a blog is. Yeah, good luck with that. Um, <laughs> so had Turner registered his blog first, he would have had the exclusive right to use his name on his blog coast to coast. Nobody could have started a blog with the same name. And he would have avoided this whole problem. The cost to register a trademark, 325 bucks if you do it yourself. I do not recommend doing your own registration because it is hard. Um, just saying, at least consult an attorney before you try it on your own, if you want to try it on your own. But again, it's um, So yeah, you might be spending a couple of bucks um, to do it, but it keeps someone from stealing your blog out from underneath you. Um, so when I saw the story, I was like on the phone to all my friends who had blogs and podcasts and cool video shows. I'm like, dudes, go register your stuff now. And just so that your name in, to your product is protected. Um, and so you don't have to become the next Turner Bar. And I don't know if anyone took my advice, but um, I'll tell you, you know, one of my blogs is there's a couple of rules about you're registering your own name as your blog, so I have to wait for that time period. But um, yeah, I'm registering my name as sec the second I'm allowed to. So How long is that time frame? That time frame, if you are naming your blog like, after yourself, you may have to wait until you have what's called acquired distinctiveness, which generally requires five years. Um, Where are you registering? The United States Patent and Trademark Office, USPTO.gov. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of so. Uh, so I'm just putting it out there. Trademarking should be on the radar um, when it comes to protecting your blog. Also, before you name your blog, I was shocked. How many marketing companies, marketing companies who do this for a living, come up with brands for their clients and don't check the USPTO database? And the trademark database is actually not that hard to use. Um, so before you come up with your cool, before you launch your website with the cool name you want for your blog, go make sure it's available. Because it really sucks to buy the domain and build the site and be all excited to find out, yeah, you're fucked. You gotta change, your, you gotta change all your stuff. And I had to tell a client that they hear. I was like, yep, yeah, you're, you got nothing. They, you got the you got the uh, cease and desist letter, and yeah, you don't have you don't have any legs to stand on. Um, so, yeah, marketing companies apparently aren't checking the database. Um, so, yeah, I recommend that. Yes, sir. So, if I get the patent, could I go after someone with that URL? You mean the trademark? Trademark. Do I get the trademark? It depends. Um, you get them a lot. If they are somebody who is using the same name on the same type of product or service, potentially. But if they were using it first, they can keep using it, but they can't expand their market. So you'd have to look at the whole situation. Um, and just because they can get the domain may not necessarily be a deal breaker. Um, so uh, <coughs> well, those are, that's all I have for my opening thoughts. So we're gonna start doing questions. So one, two, three. So keywords in a domain. Um, I have a client in Canada who's getting sued right now. Um, she has a laserdermclinic.ca, okay. and the company that's suing her owns the term laserderm. So in, how does that work? In Canada? Okay, number one, I'm not a Canadian okay. lawyer. So you have a <laughs> Canadian trademark law. Sure. Um, but do you see that common, a common thing with people using the same two words in a... It comes down to what are they using, and is it a is it a, you know an actual registered trademark versus I just don't like that your domain is similar to mine. Are people th are people being confused that they're coming to your site thinking it's ours? Um, so it's a big I get, I'm, I'm basing this on U.S. trademark law. Um, so 
Yeah, and part sometimes it comes down to is it worth fighting over? Um, because think about how much money you're spending. And I, I have a client who right now we're getting pushed back from the U.S. Uh, trademark office on his application. And I told him, I'm like, I can fight this, but trust me, you're going to spend more money fighting it than if we just let this application die and we we change it and reapply. So sometimes, you know, when you're being sued, sometimes it's better to just be like, let's settle this. Even if you're right, the question is, it's not always the legal issue, it's the business issue and what's worth fighting over. So. Yeah. How hard is it searching the U.S. patent database? Is it easy if it's like typing in my, the name of it and put in search or you have to like more than that? So if you want to use the USPTO's trademark database, patents and trademarks are different. They have, they share an office, but that's it. Mm -hmm. Patents are inventions, trademarks are trademarks. Um, so you can search for a trademark and if they do have two little uh, links at the top of their website, you know, patent, patent search, trademark search, so trademark search. And then if you're just looking for the name, you just type in the name. And they'll let you can sort it. There's a couple of different ways you can sort it. Like if it's two words, you can say, you know, combined or not. Um, you can do live or dead. Because um, the database will pop up every trademark that someone's ever applied for. Um, so if it's a dead trademark, if all the results are dead, you can go for it. Um, it gets a little complicated. This is when you hire the lawyer for an hour. Um, because just because a trademark is dead at the U.S. trademark office doesn't mean the company's not still using it. They just only have ge um, geographic, the geographic scope, which by the, depending on how long they've been using it, it may be coast to coast. So, you know, Coca-Cola could probably let all their trademarks die and not because you have to update your application periodically. They could let them all die, but guess what? Coke has coast to coast without the trademark office's help. So, uh, but yes, to use a simple database is pretty simple. <coughs> so, over here. You said that the trademarks will protect you from coast to coast. So what about companies like, say, from China that contact you and say, oh, I'd like to use your name here in China since you're not using it here. What legal right do you have at that point? I realize you're not an attorney in China. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would look at it from the situation of why would China even come to you in the first place? I, would I don't know, but I had an email with that. It really bothered me. I haven't done anything with it. I'm not. I would assume it's spam. That's um, what I would have done. Yeah. <laughs> but that made me wonder, you know, does it cover that in a global reach? No. If you want your trademark in another country, you have to go apply for it in that country. So in each country. Each country. And so that's what happened um, Burger King, actually. Um, Burger King restaurant is in Australia, but they have a different name because somebody else had registered a restaurant called Burger King there before they started opening restaurants there. So. Um, yeah, so you have to, so, you know, thinking about what you're doing, um, if you actually are planning on selling stuff in other countries, it makes sense to register your trademark there, but if you're just a blog and just happy with your blog or your podcast, and probably U.S. is as much as you need, um, but if, yeah, but uh, again, case by case situation, talk to your attorney, blah, blah, blah. Okay. All right, man with purple shirt. Uh, when you talk about registering a trademark mm -hmm. and registering for your blog or your podcast, yep. is it just one trademark or do you do trademark your domain, trademark your, I don't know, your brand, your logo, your, logo. Logo, your everything? What, what, what are you trademarking? It depends on what you're trying to claim rights in. So okay. if you want your domain, your name, your, your logo and your slogan, that could be for, that's four applications. Okay, that's four separate applications, yep. four separate fees. Yeah, so if you have a name and a logo, that's two applications. Yeah, I've had plenty of clients try to do like a PO. Can I do a two for one if my logo contains my name? It's like, no, that's, that's two applications. So you don't have to register all at the same time if people have financial reasons why they don't want to um, do it all at the same time. They can, they can you can do one and then another, and I say, you know, usually do the name first, because that's how you give you the biggest scope, but then if there's a logo you want to register later, yeah. Um, and for most most people, I would assume that you're, that a blog would only be one category. Of course, you have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis, because um, you may fall into multiple categories, depending on what you're doing with your site. So the filing fee is $325 per category. So I tell my clients, minimum is $325, but I've had clients have like filing fees up, to, up into like 1900 bucks because they're not for a blog, but for a company because they were selling lots of different types of products. 
Okay. Yes, sir. So, with my little personal business that I'm trying to succeed in, um, I've currently created like two different names, one for the personal reasons and one for like educational reasons. Okay. Um, now, at this point, would it be okay for me to actually see if anybody has claimed two of the names I've created, and if so, would it be already right created? So you want to claim, you want to register a trademark before you're using it. There's two ways to look at that. Okay. There is the option with the trademark office to file what's called an intent to use application, which means I'm not using the name yet, but I'm going to be using it in the next six months, or I, I intend to use it in the next six months. You, do, you, fi you fill out the application, you send in your filing fee, and then when you're actually using it, you send them an affidavit with another filing fee, so it's more expensive to do the intent to use. Um, so, for most people, for the um, financial perspective, it's not worth it, um, but you can do that. Um, but if you want to just check to see if it's available, you, you can jump on the database for free. Um, so there's that. Uh, I will warn you that the trademark office takes 8 to 12 months to process an application. So for a lot of people, Unless you think that there's someone else who's going to be like racing you to the trademark office to claim the name, it's just worth it to just wait till you're using it in commerce and then file it. So you, you only have to be using it for a day before you can file. So, yes, sir, in the back. Uh, how long is a trademark? A trademark um, under common law is good for as long as you are using it in commerce. So as long as you're using it, you have rights to it. We're talking about registration. You do have to update your application periodically, so which means you have to tell them what you're using and how you're using it. You have to like show them screenshots of your website, um, and that has to happen between years five and six, between years nine and ten, and every ten years after that. If you forget to update, your mark will be called um, abandoned, and you will still have your uh, geographic market, but not coast to coast unless you've established yourself. And I actually had a client happen, that happened to, they called me, not quasi panic, being like, what about this trademark? And I was like, I went and looked it up, and like, yeah, you abandoned this one in 2009. And so we, so I had to file, we had to start from scratch. Um, they have other trademarks under the same name, but it was their logo. So I was like, yeah, we, I'm like, this will be easy for us to get again. But yeah, you basically just put 325 down the toilet um, because we had to file a trademark that you just forgot to update. So. All right, yes ma'am. Can I shift gears? Yeah, this is, I just started a trademark for educational purposes. You can go anywhere you want. Um, so I'm contemplating starting an online presence about something kind of controversial. Awesome. And I'm debating whether I want to do it anonymously okay. or full out there. Uh -huh. And I'm afraid that I will either have a harder time finding jobs or will get fired. Okay. So I just, do you have any comments on that? It's very hard to run a business anonymously. You can have a pseudonym um, and things like that. Um, you can use, you know, have separate emails and whatnot to try to separate you from your business. Um, so if you want to, like, if all you want to do is just blog anonymously, you could get away with that. I have a friend who is an anonymous blogger. I have no idea who he actually is, and he takes steps to make sure no one knows who he is, just so he can avoid those types of problems. The second you want to open a business is the problem because if you file when you file paperwork with the um, corporation commission, you have to tell them who you are. Um, so, but if that's the only thing is that you're one person, you can use everything. You can find go between to almost everything else. But if you want to own your business, yeah, it's got to be your name. Um, so that's the one. That's the one time you can't be anonymous and do things legally right. Do you have a relative that you could put the business in there? <laughs> well, so, so I'm thinking it might be a non-profit at some point, uh -huh. but right now I'm just thinking about blogging and maybe podcasting. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you, as long as you don't want to create a business, you can, you can take steps to separate your online identity from your true identity with other emails and whatnot. But I tell anybody who's doing anything anonymously, be prepared to be unmasked at any time mm -hmm. and accept the consequences that could go along with that. Um, so there's ways to you know, make that less likely to happen, but 
it, you know, eventually there is eventually a paper trail or you know a digital trail back to you. So, you know, if you're unmasked, are you willing to accept those consequences? And if that's too big of a risk to take right now, maybe that's not worth pursuing at this time. And that, and that's my take on it. In regards to her question, though, if all you're concerned about is your boss seeing what it is that you're blogging about. They're not going to be tracking her down to find out that this anonymous blogger is her, do they? they well, might, it, they it depends. <laughs> it depends. I warned you. Um, because <laughs> in, if you are an at-will employee, you can be fired for any reason. So if they just don't like your blog, you could be fired. If you do something like access your, you know, check your site through work where it's going to show up through their digital, you know, what, where, where are people going with our internet, it could pop up. So could they figure it out eventually? Yeah, if there was something scandalous and became, you know, public interest and, you know, I don't want to say viral because that's just cheesy, but, you know, but if it's getting attention and the boss sees it and is like, oh, that's interesting, and somehow he starts putting two and two together, it could be unmasked. Or if someone knows what you're doing and suddenly doesn't like you, and just calls your boss. And says, hey, hey, guess what Susie Q's doing? Um, you may, I mean, that's why I say be ready to be unmasked at any time. And this is one of my rules of thumb um, about the internet, is assume every post you make is going to be seen by four people. Your best friend, your worst enemy, your boss, and your mother. <laughs> if you don't want one of them to see what you're thinking about putting out there, maybe you shouldn't put it out there. So that's, yeah. yeah, it's not legal, it's, but it's common sense. Common sense. This is kind of in the same vein. Uh, so doxing is a term for sharing someone's personal information sort of in a public space where okay. online where other people can see it. Uh -huh. um, is that a crime or is that something that could be protected against in any way other than just keeping your personal information personal as much as you can? Well, there is um, a civil claim called invasion of privacy. Um, and in some states, that includes the exposure of private information. So now if something is public, like your home address or you've put something out on Facebook, but there is no expectation of privacy on social media. I don't care what your private, I do not care what your privacy settings are. Neither does the court. So that's not just me being the stupid lawyer. It's me telling you what the court's saying. No expectation of privacy in anything you put online, regardless of your privacy settings. Um, so, if you put, if you have put it out there, or if it is accessible out there, you have no expectation of privacy. But if we're talking about you've taken steps to protect your information, like you're an unlist, you know, your unlisted phone numbers, um, cell phone numbers, intimate, intimate photos, things like that, there is an expectation of privacy. And so, if someone does put it out there, yeah, they could be, they could get in trouble. There are crimes in some states related to cyber harassment, cyber stalking, revenge porn, things like that. So depending on which laws apply, putting out someone's private information, and if it really is private, it could get you in a lot of trouble. I'm just saying, with that all, like, isn't that all public information just by, like, background checks and that type of stuff? Like, not background checks, but, like, those sites that, if you know what I mean, what I'm talking about. I, I, I think I know what you're talking about. Like, and you can just type the name and you find, find all that information. I would, I would, but with public records, it's public. It's just because it's not easy to find in everyday life doesn't mean it's not public. Yeah. Um, but I'm talking about you know private like you know photos and unlisted numbers and things like that. Gotcha. That's not out there. Yes, ma'am. In the glasses. Um, I had a question about using images for commercial versus editorial use. Okay. So um, I work in a marketing department and there's a the concept of like brand journalism, you're kind of like writing news for a company. <coughs> if you're using um, an image that's that, you know just for editorial <coughs> can can a brand journalist use that? What's the answer? It's yes. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> that's falling into the cat the subcategory of fair use. Um, you have to go on a case by case basis, and that's one of those times when you consult a lawyer to see how the, how these cases are coming out. Um, because you're using it for editorial purposes, sounds like they're trying to fall under fair use, but because you're using it to make money, 
for the brand is also a commercial use, which is a strike against you. So you'd have to look at the situation, and the company would have to look at how much risk are we willing to take mm -hmm. versus just asking for permission or getting creative comments. If you were a news outlet, it would be like, yeah, if you're reporting the news, you can kind of use whatever you want. But because you're using it for brand, you know, being editorializing as a brand, that's a slippery slope in a big gray area and consult your attorneys and yeah. So, all right, yes, sir. Uh, I was just curious if you could give a rundown on uh, what comes into play on flash mob situations. Sure. Um, I think I'm the only flash mob attorney in the country. Um, I'm a flash mob organizer, participant, and attorney. Um, so I work with groups behind the scenes um, leading up to their event to set, help them make sure that when they do whatever it is they're going to do, they're not setting themselves up to get sued or arrested after the fact. Um, so that's falling into issues like um, trespassing, criminal law, First Amendment, um, potentially littering. I mean, you, basically I look at a situation and I go, what could go wrong? What could you be accused of going wrong? are doing wrong, um, Do you should you get permission in advance versus beg for forgiveness afterwards if something bad happens, whose reputation's on the line, should you have waivers, should you get a permit, blah, 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 bing. Um, we just want to have fun, yeah, I, yeah, so it, yeah, that's fun, that's complicated, so it, depending on what the group wants to do tells me what laws I have to look up. Um, calling the police department's really fun for flash mobs, because they have, <laughs> Like, okay, can you explain? Like, this is what we're thinking about doing. Are we violating XYZ law? And they're like, why are you calling us? <laughs> um, so, but it's it's fun. Um, so, yeah, that's that's what flash mob law is. Only one in the country? As far as I know, yes. I, uh, well, I'm going to need your card. I, I, I did bring my card with me if anyone wants one. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So, I'm just trying to understand if I'm. Quoting, if you're saying that if we want to quote somebody as a source of uh, where we got the information, mm -hmm. that that's considered plagiarism, or, or we're not allowed to do that. So what do we do if we want to um, attribute it to something? How do we handle that? If it's a situation where you want to quote somebody and then add your own thoughts to it, that's commentary. That's protected by fair use. It's it's plagiarism if you're just copying and pasting something from one site to your site and just letting it be a standalone <coughs> article, basically. Well, you were saying that the people attributed you and had a quote, so... Um, so when the situation for my work was stolen, they added no original thought. The, all they did was say, Ruth wrote this cool blog, here it is, and just copied and pasted the text and didn't add a single thought of their own. So we can't do that? No. I mean, I mean we can't it. promote your blog. We can't say that you did something really great and we want to be promoted to a group. If you want to do that, that's when you need to get permission. Oh, if you, I, I, I've had people like, say, hey, I really love this blog post. I would love to use this as a handout for a seminar I'm doing. And I, you know, and if it's something that I've written on my own site, I usually say, yeah, sure, give an attribution and make sure you include the URL. But yeah, but if that's all you're doing is a copy paste, <coughs> that's copyright infringement. If you're saying, hey, Ruth had a cool thought about you know, social media networking and why she likes using Twitter, and you, uh, you know, include a paragraph, not the whole article, and then you add in your thoughts about why you think it's important or why it matters or Something original. Something um, original. You're probably fine. And that's what pissed me off when these Twitter lawyers stole my stuff. I was like, had you added like three sentences about why why what I did why what I wrote was worth sharing with your audience, I would have been totally fine. But because you became a replacement for my blog, right. fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no, you're no, ripping you're off not. my stuff. You're a thief. Right. Yeah, that and you can be making money off of it if you have ads on your site. Exactly. Monetize it. That's exactly it. So if you would have added an insult, he would have been fine. <laughs> 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 I mean, if you had insulted me, I would have been fine. I thought you were like a sprinkler thing, so kind of like, <laughs> <laughs> So I'm like, all right. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. You handed it up before. I was just curious about um, slogans or Oh yeah, no, they don't differentiate at the trademark office. A trade
trademark is a trademark is a trademark. Right. Now you can, if you want to just put everybody on notice that I'm claiming this as a trademark, you can do the little superscript TM, which is just an announcement to the world, I'm claiming this as my trademark, don't use it. But that, that doesn't stop anybody else from using it, but they can, at least not in your geographic area, but at least put the, everybody on notice, I'm claiming this as a trademark. You cannot put the R in the circle until you act, until you register it. I've seen some people get that wrong. So TM is just, I'm claiming it. R is, I registered it. But yeah, so for, so for a slogan, you can TM it. And that should discourage people from copying it. But if you want to register it, yeah, the filing fee is a filing fee. Oh, okay. So, yes, sir. Can you talk about Pinterest and infographics? What about it? Just sharing <laughs> them and different things like that. Like what is I know they're 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 meant to be shared. So how do you how do you what's what are the proper ways for those things? Okay. Well that's kind of two different situations. So infographics are generally put out to be shared. Hopefully whoever created it includes how to attribute it and how they want you to use it. Um, it's nice when they do that. Otherwise I instead of copying and pasting I would be I would link back. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's kind of infographics are usually meant to be shared, so I, I'm less concerned about them. Uh, but hopefully the creator tells you how to attribute. Um, or how you know, or just a free for all. Pinterest. <laughs> Pinterest. <laughs> um, <laughs> you all know that YouTube is copyright infringement city, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I assume the same is true for Pinterest. Yeah. Um, so I tell people I'm not on Pinterest. Um, I don't need another internet addiction. Um, so I tell people before you repin something, go back to the source to make sure that the original creator has given permission to pin. Um, like on my blog, there is no pin it button for a reason. I don't like Pinterest, don't pin my stuff. Um, so, but if some, but if the original says, yeah, sure, pin away has the Pinterest button. If you want to repin it, go right ahead. But I, I, I wouldn't. I would not pin or repin until I knew for certain that I wasn't committing infringement. Because yeah, they don't differentiate on that site it's between pinning and repinning. Copyright infringement, copyright infringement. Don't do it. Yes, Melissa. Sort of on the same vein. A lot of the fashion bloggers, for example, will go to the J. Crew site, save a picture of the winter coat that they love, and they'll be like, "Here's what you need to wear for Christmas," mm -hmm. and they just post the pictures mm -hmm. and the price with a link back to the J. Crew site. So what are the ramifications of that? That, again, fall, probably falls under fair use. So okay. um, so if they are adding commentary, like putting together outfits and explaining mm -hmm. why things are a good value or fashionable or whatever, that might be enough to get to be the fair use um, or be a copyright infringement argument. One thing to, to remember with copyright infringement is the only person who can come after you for infringement is the copyright mm -hmm. holder. So if they don't know what you're doing, or they don't object, they're never going to come after you. Um, I have the same discussion with people at Phoenix Comic Con about fan art and fan fiction. If the person whose stuff you're, you're using likes it or doesn't care or doesn't know, you're never going to get in trouble. Mm -hmm. So that probably is what's happening with the fashion bloggers, is that J. Crew is like, hey, you're talking about us. Awesome. Keep doing that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's what, probably what I would assume that they're doing. but. Um, it's, it's, there's always a risk that if you're using without permission that you could be accused of infringement. Mm -hmm. So, is there a question up in the front? You kind of got my I got it. Okay, <laughs> yes sir. Yeah, but uh, doesn't it apply even to Twitter if I were to retweet a picture which is someone else's? So if somebody commits copyright infringement and posts a photo and you retweet it, I would go back and look at um, the Twitter terms of service to see if there's some verbiage in there that says only the person who did the original tweet would get in trouble versus the retweeter. Because there may be a term of, there may be something in the terms of service that says by tweeting a photo, you are attesting that you have rights to use it, which could be a defense for anybody who gets in trouble for retweeting. Um, for if, they, if everyone gets in trouble. Um, so. I would hope that the chances of someone getting in trouble for a retweet is pretty low, but again, it comes down to what's the copyright holder going to do. Um, I've never seen a, a Twitter copyright case, so 
I mean, it could happen. Maybe yeah, I'm just it has wondering how is that different from re repinning? Repinning. Right. And I would have to would look at the situation too to see if if the law is going to differentiate between just hitting the retweet button where you're not, or you're only just copying the whole thing versus you add your own thoughts, RT, right. if that's different or not, or if you're down if you're downloading and re and re putting it out there, that's probably different. So this I haven't seen a case yet on it. Um, and I would be surprised if it's actually happened, but you know, we'll see if there's ever going to be a case on that. So yeah, welcome, welcome to my gray area world. <laughs> so, all right. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, I'm going to ask you what is proper at proper, uh, credit given on a photo. Let me, let me, let me kind of throw a scenario out there. I have a neat little WordPress plugin that does sliders. Okay. I'm using Creative Commons pictures for it, but obviously I want to give these folks the credit for for their photos. Mm -hmm. So do I have to list that below the photo? Can I just put it in the alt text of the photo? Um, do I have to put a little tag on the photo? You, you know. Yeah. I I would assume that if as long as it's on the post that that the person who put the photo into Creative Commons would be satisfied. Um, I've never seen anyone get mad, but like, you know, oh, you didn't put it right below the photo, you put it at the bottom. I would think as long as the reader can tell where the photo came from, that that should be enough. I know for me, my standard of practice from my own blog is I do it as the caption on the photo. I do the name of the photo by whatever their Flickr name is, from Flickr, and then I put in parentheses Creative Commons license. So that way, everybody's on notice, I'm playing by the rules. It looks really bad when, the, when it looks like the copyright social media lawyer is committing copyright infringement. <laughs> so part of that is just like, I am covering my touch. Um, so, but that's where I put it. But could you put it at the bottom? Probably. Um, I do the same thing on, on um, Facebook. If I use a photo from Creative Commons as part of a post, I'll usually put the photo up there and then and I'll take the first comment and I'll say photo attribution and give it and put it right there. I do the same thing. My cover photo on Flickr is from Creative Commons, and and under the um, about section of my my law firm, I say photo from, and that's where I give the attribution. Because sometimes you can't, depending on the technology or the site, you can't put it right underneath it or build it in. Um, so, but as long as it's in there somewhere. I would hope that the photographer who owns the copyright is like, hey, you're doing your best to play by the rules. It's in there where the reader can figure it out. I'm happy, but you know, could someone get pissed off at you and complain? Yeah, but in that situation, I would wonder: Are they going to sue you, or are they just going to say, "Here's how I want you to fix it"? Right. So. Yeah, and, and like I said, this is actually a plug-in. I mean, normally I would just do it in line with the with the yeah. photo, but yeah, you know, when you have when you have a dynamic slider, it's a little bit harder right. to right. Just put okay. it right below. Right. So I would hope that they would be satisfied that as long as it's in there where uh, where a reader could figure it out. I don't know. I would. Well, I mean, that I, I, I was just trying, you yeah. know, without having the expertise. Of right. The, because all text is harder. All text is in where a reader can easily see. I mean, is that easy? That's the source of the page. Right. Huh? You'd have to be the source of the page. Right. Right. Yeah. I'm saying. So I would, would you consider that, that easy? Saying. Yeah, I, would, I mean, I would put it on the text. I would want to keep it right out there, plain as day, that everyone can see where it came from, um, and so that they could easily go find the original if they wanted to. So, yes, sir. Along those same lines, I'm actually wondering. So, I do a podcast, and I'll put in Creative Commons music uh -huh. in, in, the, in the show. The way I've always attributed it is I put it in the, the show notes uh -huh. that, that's attached to the ID3 tag. Mm -hmm. I put it in there, and I also put it on when I post it on, on the website. Is that okay, or do they require you to audio, like, because it's an audio medium, uh -huh. do you have to say, like, this music by? Right, at some point in the show. Well, I would guess, if, is this music that, like, you use over and over again, like your intro or outro yeah. music? Yeah. I would probably contact the artist and say, how would you like, I, you know, say, I, I love your music, I'm going to use it, um, what would you prefer? Okay. Um, so, you know, I'm thinking back to an old podcast called Evo at 11. Um, and they, at the end of their podcast, they said music by, and so they always gave the attributions there. Um, and I don't know if I, I don't even know the licensing copyright issue with that, but it's not a big deal to build it in. So, yes, ma'am. Do you 
Who wants the last question? Leave your hand up earlier. Man. The last question so would be registering help. with the state. Does it matter, even, even though it's just a courtesy and you don't really, do you gain anything from registering with the state, I guess is my question. Register your trade name with the state. Mm -hmm. It prevents the, it prevents another company from registering the same name in the state, but beyond that, no. So, but you know, it's you know, for Arizona that costs ten bucks. I know. So, so do I, it? I did yeah. it. Okay. So we know whether you want to do it is your call, but I paid my ten bucks, okay. so no one can be Carter Law Firm for five years. So, there thank you. Go. All right, thank you guys all for. While Danny is doing her final thoughts and we're doing the raffle drawing where I'm going to win the Amazon gift card, uh -huh. um, uh, I'll get my cards out if anyone wants to have them yeah. to take home with them. Thank you, Ruth. All right, before we get into other things, um, coming up next, as I said this morning, and if you saw tweets throughout the day, we are going to meet at Enchiladas for dinner, and that is my direction is bad. That's right. That, that way, way. That is that just way. like a short five minute walk. I could literally go like this. It's up there. <laughs> That's how, sure how I drive around town <laughs> on our group system. It's a, a miracle because I always get backwards. So. Anyway, <laughs> so we would like to take a head count right now. It's okay if you're not going. We're not going to judge you harshly. <laughs> <laughs> but we just, we're going to send Eric over to just make sure we have a reservation, but we just want to give him an idea. So raise your hand if you're joining us for dinner. All right, start counting. Raise your hand high. Okay. And I, I, I got two people. Okay, yeah, so two one, two. I'm your right home. So you're going with me to dinner. Four, five, six, seven. Eight. Okay. Okay. Six, seven. Eight. Okay. 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 Six, seven. Eight. Okay. 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 Okay.
until we have a winner that is present, because you must be present to win. So, a ticket number. This is for the Snagit Bundle Prize. Ticket number 458333. Three, three. Boom once, going twice. All right. Lost. So, we've also got the uh, Amazon laptop and tablet. everyone to volunteer. We cannot run this conference without our volunteers. So we don't want there to be repercussions or, you know, you know, a, a downfall for a volunteer. We want everybody to be encouraged to volunteer their time in this wonderful conference. We as staff members, we love this conference and we put everything into it and we want the best for our volunteers and for our attendees and so we forfeit our um, rights to, to raffle prizes. Nobody ran that by me. <laughs> <laughs> Recycling happened to pick up the power outlet thing. They left the remote. It's a remote power outlet. You don't know what the outlet is without the remote. All right. Next ticket. All right. Next ticket. Roger Gillespie. <laughs> Very happy. 
casual here as Quick Phoenix all year. Okay, I'm going to drop for something else. That works. How about we do the Amazon oh. gift card? Yeah. 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 This is this is a big one. This seems to be a pretty big deal. <laughs> Amazon gift card, and I just want to, like, where is that? Oh, here it is. This was, this uh, gift, this $50 Amazon gift card was sponsored by Social Ads University. Yeah. So go ahead and check them out on Facebook. And mm -hmm. this, Kathy Cowley, ticket number 458365. Gone, read your off. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm trying to get positive thoughts in my head. I know, I'm 